Okay, so we're going to pick up with bone physiology. So one of the minerals or electrolytes that's extremely important for human physiology and really for mamm mammalian physiology is calcium. And we have to balance calcium within the organism. So calcium balance, this is going to be very important. So we need to be able to balance calcium, and calcium is going to be balanced in part through the bone, because the bone is a huge calcium reservoir. In fact, it's so big, they've done experiments before where they've cannulated a dog, and they've run the uh, the blood supply into a mechanism that extracted calcium and then run it, ran it back into the dog. So the dog had a uh, constant calcium removal occurring. And the dog just kept on producing more and more and more and more calcium. A ton of calcium coming out of this dog. And it was all being just extracted from the bone. What does that say? It was the reservoir. reservoir. So the bone is just a big calcium depot or a big calcium reservoir. Your normal blood levels for calcium, so normal blood calcium, the levels are between 9.2 and 10.4 milligrams of calcium in a deciliter of blood, one-tenth of a liter. Okay. So if we dip below or above this normal blood calcium level, we begin to see some pathophysiology that begins to emerge. And it's going to be partially the bone's responsibility to help maintain this normal homeostatic level of 9.2 up to 10.4 using a variety of feedback loops. Before we get to those feedback loops and the description of that homeostatic regulation, we need to understand things like hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia. So hypocalcemia is going to be low calcium. And we want to avoid hypocalcemia. And part of the reason is because we don't want to have spasms that result in over contraction of muscles like we have here in this individual's hand. So when calcium levels are low, membrane potentials, which we don't really know a whole lot about membrane potentials yet, but suffice it to say... Like, does it look swollen? Is that caused by that thing? Or is that just a pattern? <laughs> 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 it, yeah, without knowing anything about the, the, the individual here, um, if it's edema, it's most not likely not because of the calcium. It's most likely because of reduced blood flow or, or something along those lines. Um, I'm, I'm actually thinking it might be a, just a fat hand, <laughs> which I think is the correct medical term. That's obese hand. <laughs> so low calcium levels, you end up with a change in your membrane potential. I got to give you just a really brief little introduction to the membrane potential. If that's my membrane, I have electrolytes in my intracellular fluid that make the overall inside of the fluid negative, and I have electrolytes on the extracellular side that make the extracellular fluid overall positive, and this is just relative to each other. That's called a membrane potential. Batteries have potentials. We measure potential in voltage, and it's basically the ability to do some sort of work. We have potential to do some sort of work. You put a battery inside the flashlight, turn it on, it does work, right? It turns the light on. In, the ter in terms of nervous system and muscle physiology, having a membrane potential where we polarized around the membrane it gives us the ability to contract the muscle or to generate a signal up and down the nerve. 
Now, when we have low calcium levels, we actually begin to see these ions redistribute on either side of the membrane. So the membrane potential actually reduces. And so we have uh, uh, the, the two sides of the membrane becoming closer and closer to the same charge. So the outside of the cell decreases its positive charge. The inside increases towards a positive charge. And so we reduce that membrane potential. Now, the result of that, <clears throat> these ions or these charges are due to high calcium levels outside of the cell high potassium levels and DNA and protein levels inside of the cell, making it overall negative inside, overall positive on the outside. Now we're beginning to reduce that membrane potential and the result is that sodium enters the cell far more easily. Okay, so sodium begins to enter into the cell more easily, and that causes that increase in the intracellular fluid. Now, we begin to reduce our ability to do work. And one of the abilities to do work is muscle contraction, okay? So we may have muscles that go into a state of contraction, and they can't relax. They just contract up. In your hand, it's uncomfortable, but it isn't really life-threatening today because you're going to get medical treatment. Where this becomes a real problem with hypocalcemia is when the muscles that can't relax are up here in the trachea. And so they close off the larynx. And this can lead towards a very life-threatening condition called suffocation. Okay, so that's just low calcium levels. So make sure you're consuming your fair amount of calcium, your daily allowance of calcium from free ice cream and dairy. Now the other side, so above 10.4 milligrams per deciliter, is going to be hypercalcemia, just simply high calcium levels in the bloodstream. Now we also have some issues with uh, ion exchange. If we elevate the amount of calcium that's inside of the bloodstream, it's going to affect things like the nervous system. And the nervous system begins to depress. So the nervous system depresses. And when the nervous system depresses, muscle contraction loses its effectiveness. And if that muscle contraction is your heart muscle and you lose effectiveness at pumping blood, you can go into cardiac arrest. So low calcium, not good. High calcium, not good. So how do we keep it between 9, uh, nine and 10.4, or 9.2 and 10.4 milligrams uh, per deciliter? What does it say after a nervous system? Depresses the nervous system is depressed. The muscle contract or muscle contraction loses effectiveness. This could lead towards cardiac arrest. Also very life threatening. So we want to maintain calcium levels. Obviously, sometimes we can't. We need support from the medical community. But for the most part. The body does a really nice job of dealing with the calcium levels. And it's because we actually have redundancy in our calcium homeostasis system. There are going to be three calcium homeostasis pathways.
the first is going to be the first that we'll talk about is going to be the calcitriol pathway. And actually, we've already really talked about this. And you should remember that this starts in the skin, right? So we have conversion of um, uh, hydroxy seven D hydroxy cholesterol into vitamin D, and then vitamin D enters the bloodstream. It gets converted into uh, calcidiol, and then it gets converted into calcitriol, and kidney, liver for calcidiol, kidney calcitriol. Then it, calcitriol enters the bloodstream. You have an increase in um, uh, bone uh, release, so a decrease in bone deposition of calcium, a decrease in kidney excretion of calcium, and an increase in absorption of calcium through your diet to bring calcium levels back up. Okay, so I'm not going to um, really deal too much more with that. We've already gone over that, and we had a, a, an image of that. Hopefully you're remembering this. If not, you can go and review the lecture online. So this, by the way, this is when calcium levels begin to drop. We're going to utilize the calcitriol system to bring calcium levels back up. We also have a uh, system that's called the calcitonin system. And the calcitonin system is going to be used when we have high calcium levels. So we want to bring calcium levels back down. Calcium levels are too high. Now, calcitonin is going to be an endocrine hormone that's produced by the thyroid. So the hormones produced by the thyroid, and it is the stimulus for calcitonin release, and that's what you can see over here. The, the stimulus to cause calcitonin release is an increase in plasma calcium, okay? So calcitonin uh, uh, interacts here with the thyroid and causes calcitonin to be generated by the thyroid. So hormone produced by the thyroid, it's excreted when calcium levels are high. And what you can see is as it enters the bloodstream, it's going to go and interact with the bone, and calcitonin is going to go and interact with the kidneys. And you can see both of those interactions are actually going to have negative effects. In the bone, calcitonin inhibits osteoclasts. Now, why does that make sense? What is an osteoclast? It breaks down bone and releases the minerals that have been trapped up in that bone. So if we can inhibit those osteoclasts, and if we can stimulate, what do you think we're going to stimulate? Osteoblasts. So we're going to inhibit the osteoclast because that re reduces the amount of uh, calcium being released from the bone. We're going to stimulate osteoblasts because this begins to take calcium from its, so or from its circulation back into the bone. So the net result here <clears throat> is for calcium to be absorbed into the bone. Now, it will also affect the kidney. And in the kidney, you can see that we are going to excrete more calcium. Okay, so we're going to excrete more calcium in the kidney. Effectively, we're reabsorbing calcium into the bone, we're getting rid of excessive calcium through the urinary system, and this has a net result of reducing those calcium levels as they have begun to increase. Calcium. More calcium.
The third system is centered on an endocrine hormone known as parathyroid hormone. And parathyroid hormone is going to be excreted when calcium levels are low. Okay, so this is actually going to complement the calcitriol pathway. So calcium levels are low, and we interact with the parathyroid gland, which are these little extra tissues on the surface of the, para, on the, surface of the thyroid gland. So this is uh, a second tissue or organ. You have the thyroid, and then you have these little patches of tissue called the parathyroid glands, and they begin to generate parathyroid hormone. Now, as parathyroid hormone is being generated, because of low blood calcium levels, we get PTH that's produced, enters into the bloodstream, and then is going to affect calcium levels, resulting in an increase in calcium in four different ways. Okay, so we're going to have four mechanisms that will all result from parathyroid hormone in an in, in increase in blood calcium. The first thing that parathyroid hormone can do is it can bind to osteoblasts. And in binding to osteoblasts, it is going to cause a increase in a protein called rank L. R A N K L. It stands for receptor activator of NF kappa B ligand, which I know doesn't make any sense to you right now, but hopefully we'll hear in just a second. So when Parathyroid hormone binds to the osteoblasts. We have rank ligand that is going to, so you can see here's our parathyroid hormone, binds up to a receptor, the parathyroid receptor on osteoblasts, and it causes the osteoblast to, to uh, the downstream effect is to, to increase this thing called rank L, the receptor activator of NF kappa B ligand. Okay, so the osteoblasts begin to produce the rank ligand, and rank ligand causes an interaction with rank, which is the receptor, activ receptor activator of NF kappa B. This receptor activator of NF kappa B, so here's rank in this kind of goldish color, that is going to be on our osteoclasts, or at least our osteoclast precursors. Okay? So rank ligand is in a osteogenic cell. that eventually will become an osteoclast. Okay, so parathyroid hormone interacts with the parathyroid hormone receptor. That osteoblast then expresses rank L. Rank L interacts with the rank ligand that we find on the osteoclast precursor, the osteoprogenitor or osteogenic cell. And that interaction causes differentiation to form an osteoclast. Now, I just formed an osteoclast. I just increased the number of osteoclasts that are present in the bone. So what would be the end result of this first mechanism? I now have higher levels of osteoclasts. This will lead to higher calcium levels. And where are these higher calcium levels going to be? Yeah, so it's going to be in the blood, so we're going to release more calcium from the bone into the blood. Is that osteogenic or osteogenic? Oh, I'm sorry, osteogenic. It's an osteoprogenitor cell. It's a stem cell, bone stem cell. 
that gets activated through this re reaction or this interaction with rank and rank line. Okay. By the way, what do you think is going on to get from this interaction to the production of rank L? Probably some sort of cellular path, uh, inter, uh, cellular um, signaling pathway. Could be a cyclic AMP, could be a PIP2, could be a uh, phosphorylation cascade. Wasn't that uh, one of the questions on the exam? Was to draw a cyclic AMP second messenger system? Oh, yeah. So that could be what's going on here to have this change in physiology. Just trying to, trying to get you to, to kind of put some stuff together there. Um, how about here? Same thing. You have interaction. This would be a first messenger type interaction. You're going to have a series of, uh, of things that occur that cause a physiological change, probably increases in genes to have that differentiation process occur. Okay. End result here, osteoclast numbers increase that leads to an increase in calcium release because that <coughs> is just what osteoclasts do. <coughs> Parathyroid hormone has three more mechanisms by which it acts. There are also going to be receptors in the cells of the kidneys that allow PTH to bind to the kidneys. And the end result here is to have a decrease in calcium loss in the urine. So we down function the urines to conserve calcium. Parathyroid hormone is also going to interact with the kidneys and results in stimulation of the kidney to synthesize. So synthesis of calcitriol. And then you would have all the effects related to calcitriol. And then one last bone-related thing here from parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone also interacts with the cells of the bone to block collagen formation. And that's really interesting, right? Because if I have a reduction in collagen formation, I don't have fibers that the hydroxyapatite or that the calcium phosphate can bind to. And so calcium would remain into the blood rather than being bound up on the collagen fibers. So this results in a decrease in bone mineralization. Okay, so really we have two different things occurring uh, in the bone and two different things occurring in the kidney. In the bone, we have an increase in bone mineral release and a decrease in the ability for that bone to remineralize. In the kidney, we are just simply reducing calcium payoff in the urine. We're not producing uh, high calcium levels in the urine. We're conserving calcium. And then we are also generating or synthesizing, causing synthesis of calcitriol, which will result in also additional conservation of calcium in the blood. Everybody looks kind of bored. You need to stand up and move around a little bit, do some jumping jacks. You're almost there. I, I mean, you're so close to some ice cream, I, I can taste it. <laughs> Have you seen it? <laughs> okay, moving on. Okay, so everything we just talked about was related to bone tissue. And now I'd like to move on to joints, Wait. which is another part of the skeletal system. Okay? 
So we've discussed quite a bit about bones. You've been learning about the bones and the anatomy, um, basically the 206 bones. Hopefully you know all of them by now. So we're going to move on to joints. Joints are also known as articulations. And the joints are going to be links between bones or links joints link bones together that's what i'm trying to say get rid of that s get rid of the s yeah get rid of it. link bones together joints link bones together <laughs> And by linking the bones together, we actually can form functional units. The humerus on its own is just a bone. <laughs> it doesn't do a whole heck of a lot. But you add in joints with the scapula and the uh, radius and the ulna, and now you can have elbow flexion and extension and shoulder abduction and adduction and circumduction and all kinds of movements. So by having the joints present, the bones actually become much more usable. <laughs> I mean, in all reality, they're still usable because they're calcium storage depots, but now we can begin to move. All right, when we look at joints, we're going to divide them up into four classes or four main groups. The first is going to be bony joints. We're going to talk about bony joints, fibrous joints. Fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, and synovial joints. The bony joints, actually, I got a picture here of a bony joint. This is our coaxial bone or one side of the pelvis. A bony joint is going to be or is going to occur where two bones fuse together and they become like one seamless bone. So we can give you here an example of the pelvis or the coxal bone. Um, at birth, the pelvis was actually three separate bones. And you can see them here illustrated in color. Uh, unless you're colorblind, then I guess you can't. So at birth, the, pel the pelvis, each of these, of these uh, joints here, and down here as well, they were actually more cartilaginous. And then as you age, you begin to form bone over that cartilage during the adolescent years. So throughout adolescence, there's still three bones that would be identifiable. And they are going to be the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. By the time we get to adulthood, by age, not maturity, those three bones fuse to one. And so then we get the coxal bone because these cartilaginous joints no longer, no longer exist. They've been fused together. Okay. Now, in all reality, if we were to go in and microscopically analyze those, those joints, there would be some anatomical differences present there. You would see um, the, the, the remnants of the, of, the, of the joint would still 
it would still be present, but you can't really see it all that well in an adult pelvis because it's fused together quite nicely. It's getting late. So bony joints, and then second class is the fibrous joints. And a fibrous joint is going to be a joint where two bones come together and they are held together by fibers, hence the term fibrous joint. And most of the time, those fibers are collagenous fibers or collagen fibers. Okay, so fibrous joints, they're two bones that are held together by collagen fibers. Um, there are going to be three types of fibrous joints. The first type are the sutures. And you should recognize the sutures as being the joints that we find in the skull or the cranium. Now, in the sutures, the collagen fibers that are present are very short. And so this provides very little movement. In all reality, though, there is some movement there. If you kind of squeeze on your head really good, you actually can get it to move a little bit. So everybody grab your neighbor's head and start to compress. There are three types of suture joints. So we go from fibrous joints, three types of fibrous joints, one of the types of sutures, and now there are three types of sutures. And if you know anything or if you've ever talked to people who work with wood, these structures are going to be analogous to some of the joints that can be produced in woodworking and joinery. A serrate. This is a joint. This this would be a serrate, and it's a wavy line. And they kind of the, the joint gets locked together in those wavy lines. It's like a, a dovetail if you are familiar with um, that type of joinery. Dovetail would look something like whoops, something like that, and then the other side would. That's terrible. <laughs> Oh, that made it any better. <laughs> that was terrible. Let's try that again. So the, the serrate is interlocking wavy lines like a dovetail. Go very, very slowly. So the joint holds together like that. One bone would fit into the other bone. There's also a lap joint, and that lap joint we are going to have bone that overlaps at an angle. This would be analogous to a miter joint. The ends of the bones overlap like that to create the joint. And then last is a plane joint. In the plane joint, the bones butt up to each other. That would be analogous to what's known as a butt joint. Between the two pieces of wood just butted together. Uh, the second type of fibrous joint is uh, called the is called a gomphoses, and these are what we find 
in the mandible that hold the tooth in place. Okay, so the gomposi is the joint between the mandible and a tooth. And what you can see, it's a pretty uh, prevalent in this picture here, is that the, uh, the tooth is going to be held within that joint cavity by really small little ligaments. Uh, so the fibrous joints uh, that we just talked about, the, the uh, sutures, collagen was the little fibers that held the, the joint together. We're going to have collagen fibers here as well that attach to the bone and to the tooth itself. So the tooth is held in place by short collagen fibers. Those short collagen fibers are referred to as the periodontal ligaments. And then our last fibrous joint will be the syndesmosis. And one of the most outstanding places that we're going to find this is between the radius and the ulna, the two bones in the forearm. So a syndesmosis, in this case you can refer to it also as the interosseous membrane or the radial ulnar syndesmosis. This is going to be a joint where bones are bound by long collagen fibers. Now, Compared to our other two examples of fibrous joints, the sutures and the gonfoses, because these fibers are longer, we're actually going to have a slightly larger amount of movement. So it allows a little more movement. And of course, the example that we're showing here is that endoraceous membrane is radial radius on the bones of the forearm. Okay, joint type 3 is going to be the cartilaginous joints. Cartilaginous joints. Picture here. Some cartilaginous joints. These are going to be joints that are joined by, as you should expect, cartilage. Now that cartilage that joins these two bones or joins two bones, they're going to take on some slightly different appearances, but they basically all have uh, a very similar structure. Uh, we're going to have two different types of the cartilaginous joints, basically based off of the type of cartilage that's present and then also the shape or overall structure of the cartilage itself that joins the bones, bones together. So two types. The first type is going to be the synchondrosis, and this type of cartilaginous joint, the type of cartilage we're going to have present is going to be hyaline cartilage. And typically it's more of a bundle, which is what you can see here. It's more of a bundle or a plate of cartilage.
the uh, uh, synchondrosis uh, sternum. I don't know what a fib is. I mean, I know what a fib is, but that's not what I meant to write. The sternum and the rib are going to be held together, at least the, um, the sternal side of the rib is, is, is held together by this type of, of a joint. Um, we also are going to have a temporary synchondrosis in our epiphyseal plate, our growth plate. The second type are going to be referred, referred to as synthesis. And there are two primary places where we have synthesis or syntheses. Uh, the uh, cartilage that's between each of the vertebrae and then uh, at the tip of the pelvis between the two pubic bones. We have a synthesis there as well. Uh, the type of cartilage that's going to be present in the synthesis will be the fibrocartilage and again between the vertebrae and that anterior joint of the pelvis. And these a lot of times are sort of uh, uh, endocrine responsive, which makes sense, uh, especially in females, because the pubic synthesis, which is that anterior joint of the pelvis, has to expand. This is the one, of, one of the ways we can make that pelvic bowl expand as the head of the fetus is uh, birth through parturition. Um, ironically, the vertebrae actually can become a little bit looser too during that whole birthing process. What is all of these things between? What? Between, well, um, we find the synthesis between the vertebrae and then also in the interior joint of the pelvis.